Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Hello and welcome to another episode of People, Places, Planet Podcast. My name is Dominic Chicatano, and I'm a research associate here at the Environmental Law Institute, or ELI. For decades, there has been a bipartisan consensus that federal agencies should base their decisions on evidence, expertise, and analysis. Under the Trump administration, this precedent has been notably destabilized. Inconvenient evidence has often been ignored, experts have been sidelined, and analysis has been misused to intentionally obscure important truths. This has had serious negative consequences on the integrity of the federal regulatory system weakening its capacity to deal with pressing issues like climate change. And it will fall on future administrations to work to rebuild a regulatory system grounded in rationality, one that can effectively address the issues facing American society. In today's episode, we're joined by Michael Livermore, Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law, and Richard Revez, Professor of Law and Dean Emeritus at New York University School of Law to discuss current challenges as well as considerations for the road ahead. Their new book, Reviving Rationality, Saving Cost-Benefit Analysis for the Sake of the Environment and Our Health, offers analysis on critical aspects of the regulatory process. In Reviving Rationality, they call for the reinstatement of expertise, sound cost-benefit analysis, and the rule of law in public administration. Thanks, Mike and Ricky, for joining us today to talk about your new book. I'm looking forward to what I'm sure will be an interesting and timely conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. Likewise, I'm really pleased that you invited us. So Reviving Rationality isn't your first book that kind of looks at the importance of cost-benefit analysis in federal policy. Um, Retaking Rationality was published in 2008, and in that book, you laid out your argument for the embrace of cost-benefit analysis as a way to support regulations that protect the environment, um, public health, and consumers. What has pushed the two of you to explore this aspect of policymaking and why do you think it's particularly important in policy discussions? I first became interested in this issue in, in the mid-1990s. Uh, I was serving on uh, the Environmental Economics Advisory Committee of the EPA Science Advisory Board, and we were doing the peer review of EPA's first guidelines on the preparation of cost-benefit analyses. And what I learned through that process was that there was enormous interest in these issues from the regulated community, but the progressive groups, environmental groups, other progressive groups were completely absent from the methodological discussions. So uh, under the law, our meetings had to be open to the public and we had to be able to hear from the public and trade associations for um, regular industry appear before us uh, frequently and made arguments for um, why things should be valued in certain ways, usually in low ways. Uh, And the other side wasn't there. And that created an imbalance uh, because the methodologies uh, ended up uh, skewing in a direction that was um, unfavorable to regulation and in ways that wasn't supported by economic theory and um, uh, empirical evidence. And I became interested in this dynamic and interested in how it could be um, addressed. In our first book, uh, retaking rationality was essentially the blueprint that documented how this had happened, why it had happened, what the consequences were, and how um, the um, table could be uh, leveled in a, in a desirable way. And Mike and I then uh, started an organization, the Institute of Policy Integrity at NYU Law School, um, uh, that um, was designed to um, uh, do some think tank work uh, to um, reduce the imbalance, uh, to participate directly in the regulatory process, and to also do capacity building for um, uh, the environmental community. And that's what started us working on these issues. Yeah, just another um, uh, uh, thing to keep in mind, an important kind of uh, feature of, of this uh, pol- of the policymaking environment, is just how important cost-benefit analysis is within the regulatory process. Uh, presidents, going back to Ronald Reagan, um, and even there are precursors prior to Reagan, 
uh, required agencies to in, um, conduct cost-benefit analyses of their major regulatory proposals. Uh, those cost-benefit analyses are used in internal deliberations within um, the executive. They um, form an important part of the record of review by courts. They help influence the public conversation and public perception of regulation. And, um, and as Ricky was noting, there was an imbalance of participation in how cost-benefit analysis would be conducted. So um, this is an area that, that is important, if somewhat technical and behind the scenes, um, but it has important consequences. Um, and so, um, so that was part of the reason I think we were, we were drawn to that. Thank you both uh, for providing some of that context on cost-benefit analysis and its importance. Um, it, it's my understanding that, like a lot of things, politics can factor in here too. So both retaking rationality and now reviving rationality have kind of been published at major turning points in American politics. Um, President Obama's eight years in office began just after your first book was published. How how well was the Obama administration able to leverage effective cost benefit analysis for its policy agenda? And can you talk a bit about what that playbook looked like? Sure. So part of the context here is that um, cost benefit analysis traditionally had something of an anti-regulatory reputation. It was, as I mentioned, first adopted as a major part of the regulatory process under Ronald Reagan and a lot of progressive organizations were deeply skeptical um, or oppositional to cost-benefit analysis, and that held true even during the Clinton administration when uh, you had a Democratic president who was using cost-benefit analysis and regulatory review. Uh, what the Obama administration uh, was able to accomplish was achieve something of a synthesis between um, different parts of the Democratic uh, Party constituency, those parts that liked cost-benefit analysis and viewed it as an important part of the of regulatory decision-making, and, and those groups who uh, were fearful that cost-benefit analysis would inhibit the ability of the administration to pursue a aggressive regulatory agenda on public health and environment, consumer protection, uh, regulating this uh, uh, for the stability of financial markets and the like. And what occurred over the eight years of the Obama administration was, um, essentially a running demonstration that rigorous, well-conducted cost-benefit analysis could be consistent um, with an aggressive regulatory program so that evidence and expertise and analysis could be given appropriate respect and brought into regulatory decision-making, and that could help shape the agenda. But, um, but rigorous use of these tools also often pointed in the direction of stronger protections for air quality or aggressive action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so this was the synthesis uh, that we saw. This was the playbook that we saw during the uh, Obama administration. And, uh, and it was quite successful. I mean, a lot of rules were adopted. The rules had very large uh, net benefits that they delivered to society. And, you know, just to preview a little bit of the conversation uh, as things progress, one of the important consequences of the Obama administration's use of cost-benefit analysis is that a, a large part of its agenda has proven resistant uh, to being overturned, even by a very hostile administration. Could you talk a bit about what the reaction was like to the Obama playbook, um, particularly across the aisle? Sure. So, in a sense, the uh, Republicans in Congress and um, and more broadly across the party had a choice to make when um, when the Obama administration. Uh, implemented this strategy and, and really brought cost-benefit analysis into its into its model and um, into its decision making. So one option would have been essentially to say acknowledge that this was a technique that they liked, that the, the Republican Party had made, played a major role in bringing into the administrative state uh, to uh, you know applaud the Obama administration's use of cost benefit analysis. And of course, there would be disagreements and uh, there would be fights about specific methodologies or particular regulations, but generally to kind of acknowledge that there was a common language that could be used uh, to discuss the merits of regulatory proposals. So that was the path not taken. What happened instead uh, was 
uh, a really oppositional posture um, by a, at least a, a substantial portion of the Republican Party and, and Republicans in Congress. And one of the features of that oppositional posture was to start to essentially undermine the credibility of cost-benefit analysis as a, as a methodology, either directly or uh, by trying to change the, the conversation away from costs and benefits um, and rational regulatory decision making and towards um, kind of these rhetorical uh, moves that were made. So, for example, casting the Obama administration's agenda as a regulatory tsunami or arguing that mm. job killing regulations were destroying the economy or uh, uh, claiming that the Obama administration was engaged in a war on coal. These were kind of rhetorical uh, uh, ploys to draw attention away from the reality, which was that these rules were were well justified uh, government interventions that had been through careful cost benefit analysis. Um, and so, so this was really the uh, the reaction of a, a good portion uh, of the of the, of the Republican Party. So, how did this Republican response kind of set the stage for? Donald Trump's ab abandonment of the policies and techniques that had kind of long been a part of um, Republican orthodoxy. I think that's an important point to, to remember that um, the Trump administration's uh, problematic, <laughs> to say the least, uh, treatment of cost-benefit analysis has its precursors uh, within this um, uh, within this reaction to the Obama administration. He would. He tweeted about the war on coal and job killing regulations and the like during his candidacy. And, and when he did so, he was really just reflecting uh, ideas and uh, re rhetoric that had been circulating within uh, the party for some time. And so um, essentially the stage was set for uh, the Trump administration to kind of to roll in uh, with a view um, that that these tools were were not legitimate, that um, the cost-benefit analysis wasn't a particularly important institution, um, that regulatory review wasn't, uh, you know, a, bipartisan, a matter of bipartisan consensus, um, even though it had been for, for many decades. And so the, the version of, um, of, of this kind of anti-cost-benefit analysis, anti-expertise, anti-analysis approach that we see during the Trump administration is kind of the crudest, most overt, uh, least uh, sophisticated version of uh, a worldview that had been starting to, to percolate in the party um, over the course of some time during the Obama years. Thank you. And, and it sounds like the Trump administration was at times pretty brazen in its pursuit of an agenda that favored certain private interest over broader measures of public well-being, um, and that other times it attempted to obscure the effects of its own policies. How how open would you say the administration was about its kind of disregard for evidence and cost-benefit analysis? And, and what sort of maneuvers um, did various federal agencies use to weaken or ignore best practices? The Trump administration was very brazen in its disregard for analysis and evidence. And I'll give you only a few examples. Uh, there are many. Um, so early on in the Trump administration, um, uh, there was an effort to delay the uh, dates uh, on which the Obama administration regulations would go in effect. Um, and the way that the Trump administration justified these delays was by pointing to the cost savings to regulate industry. Uh, of delaying the regulations. And that's the only part of the analysis that they did. They didn't look at all at the fact that on the other side were the foregone benefits that regulatory beneficiaries wouldn't have because of the delays. Uh, and that turned out to be a big uh, subject of challenges to the Trump administration in federal courts, and they basically lost all of those cases. Their response at the time was, oh, the benefits are going to come later anyway, so there's no loss in benefits. They'll get the benefits. Now, this made no sense and was analytically wrong for uh, two different reasons. Um, 
One was getting benefits later is not the same as getting benefits earlier. Um, there's a whole economic technique for evaluating um, uh, delay, um, and uh, we typically uh, discount future benefits to a present discounted value using a discount rate of some sort. So things, good things that come in the future are less valuable than good, than good things that come in the present. And the Trump administration wasn't acknowledging this. The other problem was that if the benefits were going to come anyway, the costs were going to be expended anyway also. So there was a... Um, um, an arbitrary distinction between the treatment of costs and benefits. And, uh, and that was endemic to the Trump administration's approach, not only in the first year when they did these delays, but later also. Um, costs were put on a pedestal and anything that um, reduced costs or constrained costs or kept costs at zero was uh, paramount. And the benefits were essentially, um, you know, often just completely ignored. Uh, to give you another example, a lot of regulations have benefits that are unquantified. Uh, that's not because the benefits aren't real. It's just that the techniques for quantifying them and monetizing them aren't sufficiently uh, developed. And the Trump administration began equating unquantified benefits with speculative, um, uncertain, uh, or marginal or small benefits, and essentially treat them as non-existent, as if they just didn't exist. And this also is a violation of well-accepted techniques in economic analysis. Uh, in terms of the analysis of regulation, these techniques are all um, codified in Circular A4, which is an OMB circular that dates back to the Bush administration, which has a structure for how unquantified benefits are taken into account. Um, I mean, I gave an example. I was once giving, um, presenting part of this book in Brooklyn, and someone asked me a question. I said, look, you know, this is like, if a nuclear bomb was like dropped in Brooklyn, it would be very hard to actually quantify and monetize the harm because, you know, there'd be all this uncertainty as to how many people would die and how long the radiation would remain in the air. and um, how many people would uh, we get cancer and die at later times and the latency period is all very complicated. So probably it would be very hard to actually quantify and monetize that harm. But no one would think, I mean, it'd be ludicrous to say that just because it couldn't be quantified or monetized, it would be trivial, it would be insignificant, it would be small, it would be like catastrophic. And the Trump administration just uh, ignored that distinction and treated all unquantified benefits as essentially non-existent. So um, it was a policy that, um, um, prioritize reducing costs to the regulated community, and in many areas, with respect to many proceedings, ignoring uh, the regulatory benefits that would accrue to the beneficiaries. Thanks, Ricky. Could, could you possibly touch on a specific regulation that the Trump administration attempted to undo through skewed cost-benefit analysis and maybe talk a bit about how the analysis was manipulated? Sure, uh, I'll give you an example and I'll show you, um, and I'll use it as a case study for the enormous disregard um, for analysis um, that pervaded the Trump administration. So um, the Obama administration had um, promulgated a regulation um, uh, limiting the hazardous air pollutant emissions of existing uh, of power plants, uh, including existing power plants. Uh, the Trump administration reviewed um, a finding implicated in that regulation and using purporting to use cost benefit analysis, determined that um, this regulation was not appropriate and necessary because it said that the costs significantly outweighed the benefits. Now, the only way that this conclusion could be supported was by ignoring the indirect benefits of the regulation. Uh, indirect benefits are sometimes referred to as, as co-benefits. Uh, the indirect benefits were very stringent reductions in particulate matter, which is a very um, um, deadly pollutant, but not one that was governed by the statutory section under which this regulation was justified. And that, in the kind of language of cost-benefit analysis, made it an indirect benefit, not a direct benefit. Now, the indirect benefit um, accounted for 
between 36 and 90 billion dollars of benefits because it saved um, a very large um, number of lives, up to 10,000 uh, human lives a year. So uh, this was a very, very significant benefit, and it was a real benefit. It was a, averting a large number of premature deaths. But the Trump administration said, well, that's an indirect benefit, and that benefit shouldn't be taken into account. We should only look at the benefit of the reductions of pollutants that are uh, the subject of this regulatory program. Now, doing this is inconsistent with um, well accepted practice in economics. I don't think there's any respectable economist would say that this is an appropriate cost benefit analysis of that rule. It's also inconsistent with Circular A4, the Bush administration circular that guides agencies on how to conduct cost benefit analyses, which says that co benefits has to have to be considered. So here is a, the Trump administration is acting inconsistently with well accepted economic theory um, over a long period of time and the actions of federal agencies going back to the Reagan administration. But that's not where the analytical problems end. It gets worse because the Trump administration wasn't even willing to be consistent in its treatment of co-benefits. In some cases, um, taking co-benefits into account could justify deregulation. Um, and then the Trump administration embraced them. And an example of that is in the rollback of the vehicle emission standards. Um, uh, that regulated the greenhouse gas emissions of um, cars and light trucks. Uh, the Trump administration uh, got a lot of the benefits of that rule by looking at safety benefits. But safety benefits are clearly co-benefits because from the perspective of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is one of the agencies that um, was involved in this regulation, EPA doesn't even have um, a safety jurisdiction. So any safety benefits have to be co-benefits for the purposes of EPA. And the Department of Transportation does have jurisdiction to regulate car safety, but not under the provision under which the standards were set. I mean, they were set under the uh, corporate average fuel economy standards that are only about um, uh, reducing energy consumption. So, so when looking at co-benefits helped the Trump administration justify deregulation, it um, embraced them. And when looking at co-benefits made the regulation um, not possible to justify, then the Trump administration uh, cast them aside, not even once acknowledging the extremely blatant inc inconsistency between these two approaches. Thanks, Ricky, for illustrating the Trump administration's approach to cost-benefit analysis with regard to environmental regulations. You talked a bit about um, emissions. Michael, could you talk a bit more specifically about climate policy? I know that's something we're all thinking about right now. To what extent did Trump's approach to cost benefit analysis in that area set the US back in its efforts to combat climate change, particularly at the federal level? Yeah, we, we could have written a, a whole book just focusing on um, the various ways that the Trump administration has uh, damaged climate policy and 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 set us set us back on that front. But to focus specifically on on cost benefit analysis, there is a concept uh, that's called the social cost of carbon. And um, what that is, what the social cost of carbon is, is uh, a way of estimating the value of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this is uh, sometimes we say it's the the second most important number in cost benefit analysis, with only the the value of mortality risk reduction being being more widely used. So anytime you have a regulation that affects greenhouse gas emissions and hopefully reduces greenhouse gas emissions, you use the social cost of carbon uh, to, uh, to provide a value for those reductions that you can compare against the, the cost of the regulation. Um, prior to the Obama administration, uh, there had been academic efforts um, and some, um, uh, some somewhat government-sponsored efforts to uh, generate an estimate of the social cost of carbon, but there was no consistent, um, widely adopted uh, value for the social cost of carbon. And so a major initiative of the Obama administration was to develop a harmonized, well-supported social cost of carbon that was based on the, uh, the recent science and peer-reviewed uh, economic models and, and so on. And this, and this was a major accomplishment and, and this number was used for a number of years uh, in major rulemakings, um, uh, in energy efficiency, uh, in uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction regulation, um, and, and in other contexts to, 
to illustrate and to um, and to provide a value for for those rules. Uh, one of the uh, moves of the one of the early moves of the Trump administration was essentially to say to direct agencies to no longer use the Obama value, and um, and in a number of rulemakings, the Trump administration uh, essentially subverted the social cost of carbon by uh, using absurdly high uh, discount rates that undervalue uh, the harms on future generations. Uh, that will be visited by climate change um, by ignoring uh, the global effects of uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and as we all know greenhouse gas emissions in the u.s have have global consequences that's what climate change is all about and so um, you know these efforts plus just not continuing to update the 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 value adopted by the obama administration as a responsible uh, administration would have done uh, really purported to justify the Trump administration's uh, uh, decisions not to move forward with strong protections for for the climate um, and also just uh, set us back in terms of, uh, you know, kind of moving forward again with with an appropriate response to uh, to climate change. And, and this wasn't just a um, sort of academic exercise. Um, you know, it had enormous consequences in terms of what regulations could be um, could be justified, and, and and the technique. I mean, the, the problem here went beyond some abstract question as to whether the appropriate value to use is a domestic or global number. What the Trump administration called a uh, domestic number um, was was an arbitrary construct, and actually, interestingly, uh, recently. Uh, it was struck down by a federal uh, judge in California uh, who um, who pointed out all of the analytical failings in the Trump administration's approach. So even if one was serious about looking at only U.S. domestic consequences, uh, the Trump administration's so-called domestic approach, for example, didn't look at impacts of climate change on U.S. installations overseas. The U.S. is kind of like a you know big military presence overseas. It didn't look at the impacts of the U.S. of geopolitical instability. So, for example, if millions of people were displaced in Bangladesh and started walking across the Indian subcontinent, uh, that would impose um, kind of serious consequences in the U.S. That wasn't looked at. They didn't look at how other countries might respond to the U.S. acting this way. I mean, if other countries then did what the U.S. did because the U.S. wasn't acting as a cooperative member of the global community that itself would have impacts in the US and those would be domestic impacts that were not looked at in the analysis. And also on the cost side, um, there was an imbalance as well. Uh, the Trump administration on the cost side uh, considered all the costs of regulation even though, so for example, a non-trivial portion of the US stock market is owned by foreigners. So the costs borne by foreign shareholders of US companies were actually counted uh, but on the benefits side, uh, the benefits that uh, people overseas might get from U.S. action were not. So this is not really a defensible number under any circumstances. And recently, uh, a federal judge uh, wrote a very sophisticated opinion explaining what all the mythological uh, problems were and terming the Trump administration's approach arbitrary and capricious. Thank you both. There seems to be a lot of work ahead, to say the least. Looking forward, what are the most important things that the incoming administration can do to attempt to reverse the course that was set by the Trump administration in this area? Well, there's a lot to be done, as you pointed out. Now, there are hundreds of regulations that either were uh, repealed or delayed or neglected or not updated as they should have been. And obviously, we don't have time to talk about those regulations. So I will say a few things about um, the core of our discussion today, which is about evidence and analysis. Um, um, so on the science front, the Trump administration has taken a lot of actions that are very detrimental. It proposed a rule that would make it very difficult for agencies to rely on epidemiological studies of human populations because the underlying medical data is not all public on public websites. Um, you know, it'd be impossible to get people to actually be um, agree to be part of these epidemiological studies if uh, everyone in the country could actually look at all of their data, uh, all of their health data. Uh, and that's why uh, 
the scientific community to develop techniques which allow for peer review and allow for um, uh, sort of proper uh, vetting of the studies without doing that um, uh, in a so-called uh, effort to uh, promote transparency the Trump administration essentially proposed a rule that would make it impo almost impossible to have epidemiological studies um, justify regulation Th that regulation hasn't been finalized yet but EPA has indicated that it plans to finalize it um, so that's kind of an example of something that just has to be um, uh, eliminated on the on, on the cost benefit side uh, there are these um, uh, EPA apparently will finalize a rule on how to conduct cost benefit analysis of air rules and air rules is where the big benefits lie and apparently what it what that rule will do and because that's what the proposed rule did is call co-benefits into questions you know indirect benefits this topic we were talking about a little while ago so the first thing the biden administration will need to do is get rid of all of this underbrush of um disregard for science for evidence for analysis um that all just needs to be erased uh from um the regulatory landscape so that we can actually uh move forward um in a um, in an analytically defensible way, uh, so that's the first um, first step. The second step is that uh, some of the elements of cost benefit analysis haven't really been updated since Circular A4, which dates back to 2003. So 17 years later, uh, some things, including, for example, the choice of discount rates, uh, just need to be need to get another look and. Um, Need to be modernized. There's new academic literature. There's new empirical evidence, and um, and the guidelines for how cost benefit analysis is conducted uh, should be updated to reflect uh, the new learning over the last 17 years. And the third element is that um, you know this is a time in our in our um, uh, in our political um, uh, life when we are appropriately very focused on inequities in um, in the way the benefits and costs are divided across our society. Um, black and brown communities have been um, subject to um, uh, poor treatment um, for, for too long. And um, distributional analysis has to become an important part of the conversation. Um, the executive orders on cost benefit analysis all say that distribution uh, that the distributional consequences of regulation should be looked at alongside the costs and benefits, but that hasn't really happened in a meaningful way until now, and it needs to happen. And that involves both developing analytical techniques and also developing a culture of responsiveness to these concerns and a way to address them. So those are what I see as the three big um, analytical challenges for the Biden administration, eliminating the underbrush of all of these um, measures that the Trump administration has taken that are inconsistent with science and economics, um, updating the elements of cost-benefit analysis to reflect new learning, and, um, and developing the techniques and, um, and the procedures for paying appropriate attention to distributional consequences. One of the tricky challenges, I think, um, that the the next administration will face, and 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 um, as it as it very likely is going to look to embrace cost benefit analysis, is I, I guess this is just a concern that I have is that um, we're moving into a dynamic where um, democratic administrations um, uh, have are using cost benefit analysis and um, are engaged in the kind of progressive overtime development of the technique that Ricky describes, and then um, and then Republican administrations do the opposite. We see something more like the Trump administration, or um, uh, that that cost benefit analysis essentially becomes a partisan issue um, uh, rather than one where there's widespread bipartisan consensus. And I'm not sure that this is something that the Biden administration can do anything about. Um, you know, they just can control what what they do. But um, something that I'll be looking for in the in the next several years, as the Biden administration hopefully moves along the lines that that Ricky was describing, is what the reaction within the Republican Party is going to be. Um, is there a move away from this kind of Trump style uh, approach and the oppositional approach that the Obama administration experienced, or um, 
it, have we settled into a new dynamic, um, uh, which would ultimately be quite uh, quite harmful for the future of uh, regulatory decision making in this country? Before we sign off here, I'd like to ask you both to kind of speak a bit to how you're feeling about the future. How optimistic would you say you are about cost-benefit analysis as a federal policy tool moving forward? Um, Cost-benefit analysis uh, has played an important role in um, regulatory policy for a long time now. I mean, the initial executive order requiring agencies to do cost-benefit analysis of major regulations dates back to the Reagan administration. And initially, it came with an anti-regulatory tinge, which is something we discussed at length in our first book and also in this revisited in this book. But when the Clinton administration uh, promulgated its own executive order, uh, the Clinton executive order was actually somewhat different, but conceptually quite similar uh, to the Reagan order. And, um, and that essentially created the bipartisan approach under which the consequence of regulation should be evaluated um, and, um, and put under some set of common metrics. And, and obviously, there are good ways of doing it, and there are bad ways of doing it. There are ways that are even-handed and ways that skew the field against regulation. Uh, we have just have experienced for the last almost four years um, uh, a case study of how uh, the techniques can be uh, mangled uh, beyond recognition to justify the regulatory agenda. Uh, but I'm confident that the new administration will um, um, correct all these issues and their you know, big um, uh, promises in how to move uh, analytical techniques forward to match uh, the aspirations of um, the constituency that, um, that, that made Joe Biden the president-elect. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic about uh, what the next term will bring uh, in, in this area. Yeah, I think I think Ricky's optimism is is well justified um, uh, for the next uh, for the next presidential term. Um, for me, the question is longer term. Um, what what is what is the uh, what does the future look like? Of course, it's a you know possible to to say um, whether the Trump administration will um, ultimately be seen as a as an aberration in in what is a longer term trend uh, towards the the, the development. And use of these techniques, and so um, hard to predict. But um, I'm certainly that is my hope that um, that that's the way that the Trump administration's record on these issues will be recorded, and that we'll all kind of look back in 20 years and say, "Wow, that was that was strange," and uh, I'm glad uh, that that was a, a one-off affair and that things went uh, back to normal. But uh, of course, that's that's up to uh, uh, political decision makers and, 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 and interest groups and, and many others who will essentially make the decision about, uh, about where these things go uh, in the coming decades. Well, thank you both. And thanks again for coming on today to talk about the importance of cost benefit analysis in the realm of federal regulations. Um, I think our listeners will really enjoy this conversation. Thanks so much for inviting us. Yeah, it's been fun to be here. Again, Michael and Ricky's book, Reviving Rationality, Saving Cost-Benefit Analysis for the Sake of the Environment and Our Health is available now. And thank you as well to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of People, Places, Planet podcast. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.